Hello, I'm Eric Meyer, and I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. I am Brian Cardell. I'm also. And uh, today we're, we have a special guest, uh, Andreas Kling, who uh, is sort of the lead on a, a brand new browser. So Andreas, hi, thanks for being here. Hi, yeah, happy to be here. So you're working on a browser called Ladybird. Mm -hmm. What I, you know, we want to talk about all of that, but like, what's the background of where did Ladybird come from to start with? Right. So it all started in 2018 when I went to a drug rehab program because I've been struggling with substance abuse for mm. a very long time. Okay. And um, when I came out of that rehab program, I found myself with just so much free time and I had no idea what to do with all of it. Uh, and I started programming because that's something I knew how to do lots of. And that's how I sort of ended up working on random things that I'd always wanted to do, but never felt I had the time for. And the big project I started was an operating system because I always thought that seemed cool, but hmm. never really um, sunk my teeth into it properly or never really gave it a, a fair shake. Uh, and I had a lot of fun with that. And it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And I put it online and other people found it and uh, a little community formed around it. Um, and um, that community just grew and grew, and so did the operating system and the scope of it. And at some point, um, we had built a GUI, and we had like all the widgets, you know, like buttons, checkboxes, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we could display rich text? Uh, and wouldn't it be sweet if we could use HTML as sort of the internal representation of a rich text widget? Uh, and I started just putting together like a simple HTML widget that you could view simple like text that had bold italic stuff like that that was that was sort of what i was trying to achieve uh, and it kind of just escalated from there because it was really fun to hack on and just add more tags um, start to add css mm -hmm. and so on and it just kind of incrementally grew um, to the point where i had to admit that i guess this is kind of a browser not just a rich text widget anymore okay uh, <laughs> And yeah, you had a background in browsers, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So this it wasn't entirely by accident. I mean, I, I did work on browsers for a long time. Um, this was just how Ladybird started. But uh, yeah, I had a career in browsers for a long time, starting all the way back in 2006 when I first worked on KHTML um, in KDE. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then I got a job at Nokia a couple of years down the line working on Qt, Qt WebKit. Um, moved to Apple from there, spent six and a half years, I think, at Apple working on Safari. Um, and then I left, um, got into some troubles and uh, ended up in the aforementioned rehab clinic. And uh, um, then now I'm doing Ladybird, which uh, was just supposed to be an HTML widget, I guess, is the essence of the story. Um, but Ladybird today has come quite far from, from that original humble beginnings, of course. Um, we've managed to build a fairly capable engine, uh, and it's all from scratch, just like everything else on Sternity OS. We kind of pride, pride ourselves on, on stubbornly just doing everything from scratch, even though hmm. it would be much more convenient not to. So one thing that it keeps jumping out at me is, um, you have Serenity is the OS. I have some questions about that because I think that's really interesting. But to stay on topic, Ladybird is the name of the browser, but you're inventing like the exciting thing isn't the browser, it's the engine, right? Sure. And um, you're building a new engine. And I mean, like a whole new, that's like a, a whole new web engine. So a whole new rendering engine, a whole new JavaScript engine, yeah. right? Like everything all the way down. Does the web engine have a name or is it just like libweb or something? Uh, it is literally libweb. Yeah. Um, yeah. All the libraries in Serenity are just called the, the obvious name. So we got libjs for JavaScript, libweb for web engine, um, and various other lib this and that. Um, so I kind of gave it the name Ladybird so that we would have some kind of public facing name that people could refer to because... Um, when you're in Serenity OS, it's easy to talk about lib this and that, but libweb didn't feel like a sort of PR friendly name, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. 
so yeah, I just talk about Ladybird as the whole project basically, but it is also the name of the UI program that is the shell for the browser engine. Mm -hmm. Where where did the name Ladybird come from? Uh, so the Serenity OS project has been using ladybugs as mascots um, okay. forever um, since the early days. It was just uh, our first icon that we had for the system was a little ladybug. And um, then we gained various ladybug themed emojis and things like that. But I didn't want to call it ladybug because then it sounds like it would be buggy. And uh, <laughs> I thought, remember when Firefox was called Firebird? That was a pretty cool name. What if we mm -hmm. call it Ladybird? Because I hear that in the UK, that means Ladybug anyway. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's actually um, the people who study insects and stuff don't like Ladybug because I guess they're not true bugs. So um, huh. <laughs> the, the Ladybird is actually the preferred. Yeah, I like it. I like the Ladybird name. Yeah, and I'm curious, you mentioned that uh, you, the Serenity project in general stubbornly tries to do everything from first principles, even though that's much harder. Mm -hmm. Is there like, what is the driving foundational principle there? Like, why did you pick that as a foundational principle? Right. So there are many things that factor into it, but the two main ones are, um, I used to work at Apple for a long time and, um, I got so used to this culture that they have there of like all the experts at the whole on, on the whole system are all in the same building um, or in the adjacent building. And you can just go talk to them. Hmm. Uh, and I always thought that is so sweet because you have some super gnarly esoteric problem in some system library and the guy who wrote it is just next door. Um, and I always felt like in the open source world, they don't have that. And I wanted to, after I left Apple, I still craved, that kind of environment. So I thought, if it doesn't exist, what if I try to create it? Um, so I wanted to just build a system where we can cultivate all the expertise in one place and we can be sort of super uh, accountable uh, so that whatever the problem is, you can never blame anybody outside the project. Like blame always stays within, within the repository. Mm. Um, and I think it's, you know, as you say, it is very difficult to work that way, but but it has also created a very strong community because people enjoy working in that kind of space where they get to become experts and they get to um, sort of take extreme ownership of, of system components in a way that I think is much, much harder in the sort of the Linux wider open source ecosystem. And the other aspect um, of why we do this is because it's fun. Uh, it's fun to build things from scratch. Everybody knows that. Uh, <laughs> and it's supposed to be, uh, it was supposed to be a hobby project that I was just doing to fill up my time. So it, it is rooted in uh, just fun time spending programming activity. Uh, and I hope it never shakes that uh, sort of origin. Yeah, I uh, I listened to another podcast that you're on. And I think we won't get as much into some of the, the details of the history and the whys and everything. But you went into a lot of that. Um, and I'm sure people could find it. Maybe it was a uh, core recursive, probably. It was core recursive, right? Yeah, that was yeah. it. Um, but it was a good. It was a good podcast, and uh, I, I really, I can relate in a way to the like the time that suddenly is free. Um, like I've had other moments in my life that were not specifically that, but where you have some really major life change, and like the minutes just go forever and like finding yourself a thing that you can throw yourself into is like really helpful for me. It was like usually art, like painting, but yeah. So uh, we have a series on here called web ecosystem health. When a uh, engine disappears, like that's the whole story, right? There's so many pieces that go into, is this a healthy ecosystem or not that, you know, maybe focusing on the exact number isn't the important part. Like, what is the ideal number? Is it three, five, seven? Like, we, we don't know, right? Um, I think Jeremy Keith said it's like political parties. Like, one is definitely too few, and 100 is probably too many. <laughs> and somewhere in between there is a, a series of debatably good numbers. But in that podcast, we have said like a bunch of times that you're more likely to lose engines than to gain them unless it's by evolution. like 
khtml becomes webkit becomes chromium and re recently uh at the web engines hackfest we had two presentations of novel browser engines it seems to really fly in the face of what i've argued but i kind of i i sort of don't think that it does and i want to ask what you think uh andreas so you know you you've said on your podcast people say you can't build a browser engine from scratch and you say sure you can i i, I don't say that you can't i just say that it's really really hard to create a fully featured and competitive like mainstream competitor to webkit and gecko and chrome i would think that for both these engines that's a ways off right sure uh yeah it's it is very um it's a very big task it's a lot of work it's going to take a long time um but i think at the same time there's never been a better time in history to build a new browser engine um why is that if you look at the quality of specifications today compared to 10 years ago, for example, mm. um, the specifications are vastly better today. Um, the effort that the um, CSS working group, for example, has put into just clarifying so many things makes it actually possible for uh, someone like me who never worked on CSS layout um, to go and write a layout engine um, because without like, a team of experts around me or, or even having to ask for help much. Uh, and I think that's fantastic. And I was pleasantly surprised because I was going into this assuming uh, sort of that it was like the olden days still, um, you know, that you would end up sitting with uh, CSS 2.1 and trying to guess your way through uh, the various descriptions of lock-in and line layout. Um, mm. Cause that's what I had seen my coworkers do at Apple, like just struggling sort mm -hmm. of with the old, uh, CSS world, but nowadays the specs have gotten so good and it's not that they're perfect, but that they're really a lot better than they've ever been. Um, so I think just from that alone, it is a lot easier today than people might think. And I, I think, um, what you describe, it's absolutely true that it's a ton of work. Um, it's absolutely true that it's hard to, to build something that would be mainstream competitive. Of course, um, you know, Google throws hundreds of engineers at this and they have like full-time people working on it around the clock, right? It would be uh, silly to to say that we're going to outcompete them at their own game. But I think it's still possible to build a browser that can uh, render a um, you know significant majority of the web at a satisfying uh, fidelity, let's say. Mm -hmm. And I also like to think that if you can gain enough momentum. Um, that you get to the point where you you have sort of a decent rendering of most websites that people care about, you can you can then gain enough momentum that you attract people to go and fill in the niche gaps that they might care about. And you mm -hmm. might attract funding and so on, right? So that part uh, is sort of up in the air. Um, but I think if we can go hard and fast enough that we end up there, who knows what can happen? So I'm, I'm just very optimistic, I guess. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. I think it's like astounding what you all have accomplished so far. Like not just a, a browser that you can view many websites on, but but also the operating system that it's built on, right? Like that's just, it's incredible for this yeah. very short amount of time and small number of people comparatively. Yeah, to so be honest, like... yeah, to be honest, the operating system was the easy part. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the operating system was easy, but browsers are hard. Harder. Wow. <laughs> Talk about that a little. Like, how so? Well, it's... Um, because operating systems are fairly, fairly simple when you boil it down to what you really want to do. Um, a kernel is a well understood, well defined problem. And um, in our case, we're just working on the POSIX specifications. We're building like a Unix compatible operating system. And that means we have like a set of APIs that we need to support. Um, and that work is, is really straightforward. And then uh, we have a UI paradigm that we borrow from sort of late 90s um, Windows, Microsoft Office, that kind of stuff. So we already know what we need to do there too. Like we need to build this kind of UI and these kind of interactions and so on. Um, and I don't know. I just found that work really straightforward. 
Whereas uh, with the web stuff, uh, I know I was just saying that the specs are better than ever, but but it's still, <laughs> it is still hard um, to get all the specs sort of gluing together, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and really when it comes to CSS, I would say CSS is so much harder than any of the other parts of the web platform because um, it's hard to work on C any CSS module in isolation. Like it really requires the person working on CSS stuff to sort of understand multiple specs at the same time and then keep them in, in their head uh, and sort of implement um, multiple things at the same time, if that makes sense. It, it, it is hmm. so much easier to work on, on JavaScript or, or HTML <laughs> uh, or, or fetch or any of those specs, right? Because they are more uh, self-contained. Yeah, to the to the point of uh, what, what you were saying about specs have gotten so much better. Like one of the things that definitely started those rigors was when Hixi sat down and specified the actual HTML parser, which never had really been written down the way that it needed to work. So there was a way that it needed to work. There was an interoperable subset and, uh, you know, that just, that was never written down. And there were some rough edges that you couldn't get people to agree on until you had something written down. So, um, I know that that has been cited as a, like a great accomplishment and other people have said that they've like used that to build, a parser. We just did a uh, podcast with uh, Martin Robinson on Servo, and in that we had this observation, this this thought that like every browser that comes along fresh and implements something ends up making the specs a little better for the next ones to do it. I noticed that like you had several issues open in the HTML parser, and I think it's probably because you're the last one to look at it with really fresh eyes, right? Sure. Yeah, that that's absolutely a thing. And it's also one of the big things that I hope that we can, um, you know, do for the community of, of web engines is to just give our input as a recent implementer. And we haven't been super great about it yet. Like, yeah, you can find some bugs that we filed, but for the most part, until recently, whenever we had a problem, uh, it was pretty safe to assume it was because of something we had done wrong. And it's only in the recent couple of months that we've matured to the point where now we start to find spec bugs more often and spec issues. Mm -hmm. And that has been a really exciting transition, actually. And we're just looking forward to helping out more in that area at least with regards to HTML and uh, CSS. In JavaScript, we were a bit ahead of uh, ahead of that curve because we our engine has been implementing some proposals pretty early. So we implemented the temporal uh, proposal when it was still quite new. Mm -hmm. nice. uh, and uh, we were able to give a lot of feedback on that, um, which then helped evolve the spec. Uh, now we're a little bit behind because I think people got a bit burned out on um, <laughs> On updating it whenever the spec changed. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that that's uh, absolutely something that um, that I, I agree with Martin on that. That um, every new engine will make the specs better, uh, and next year and the year after that, you'll be able to say that there has never been a better time to build a new browser engine. I hope. <laughs> yeah, good. That uh, feels like a sign of maturity for the platform, really. Yeah, I think so. I think so, and. You know, when you get deep into the weeds of this stuff, it's easy to point out like glaring omissions or, and things mm. that are really missing. But on the whole, absolutely, the the platform has never been more mature, I think. And for something that is so alive as the web platform specs, it is quite impressive how mature they are. People should go watch both the Servo and the Ladybird presentations at the Web Engines Hack Fest. You can find them on YouTube, on Egalia's YouTube channel. I think they're both great. They're also, I think, a little different. And I'm curious if we can get you to like clarify or talk about that a little bit because it's hard to tease apart because you have done so much that like I like I'm not sure what is and isn't in there. Um you you're not currently connected for web platform tests, right? Uh no. We uh have recently gotten part of the runner. Uh, working so we can run the ref tests but not the uh, non-ref tests 
Uh, we're okay. working on that as well, but we're not connected to WPT yet. Okay. Like if you were connected, like how do you think you would stack up? Like there's about 1.8 million subtests. I have like, no idea. If you had to just take a stab, like, <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, if we can, if we get a day to just clean out all the embarrassing crashes, then I would guess maybe 20% or something. Um, so but can I, you give us a, like some ideas about the sorts of things that aren't currently in ladybug, lady, ladybird. Wow. <laughs> uh, the sorts of things that, that aren't in there. Yeah. Well, there's like a lot of random little CSS things that aren't in there. Um, okay. so we've, we haven't implemented like every type of vertical alignment, for example. So we only have, I think like baseline and, and the middle and the top or. Uh, a bunch of them are missing, and then that is kind of true for many CSS properties. And that that I expect that to have fallout in a lot of tests because we might be able to uh, pass the test if we were just doing um, some random CSS thing more correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've taken a very vertical slice approach to um, adding functionality to the browser, and by that I mean. We don't tend to implement a whole spec and then move on to the next spec. What we tend to do is we tend to find a web page that uh, we want to improve for whatever reason. Uh, like maybe it's cool to get the New York Times to render, and then we just spend a bunch of time fixing as many issues as we can for that site, uh, and then move on to a new page or some new kind of thing that we want to be able to do. And um, that might not be the most structured approach to it, but it has been very, very good at keeping people motivated and excited and engaged uh, in the work, which um, from my perspective is almost more important than having sort of an optimal structure to the work because it's mostly volunteers working on it, right? I'm the only person who is full-time employed to do this. So I, I need to keep it fun for people to work on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you support uh, CSS Grid? Uh, yes, we do. And uh, Flexbox? It's not, yes. Our Flexbox is much more mature than our CSS grid, mm -hmm. but our grid has been improving a lot recently. Probably you don't have support, I'm guessing, for like web speech, web XR, web GL, web NN, that kind of stuff. Uh, we have the uh, beginnings of web GL, but okay. the other ones are all absent. Yeah. 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 So there's, I mean, there's just, there's so much of that stuff. Yeah, I hope like my questions don't feel negative. Like they're definitely not intended. I'm I'm actually really excited by both Servo and Ladybird. Oh, um, no, no, no. Um I think uh, it's important to be realistic about what it is that we're doing and uh, I do meet a fair amount of people who get way too excited and you know, they talk about um, oh, Ladybird is going to replace Mozilla or uh, finally some competition for Google and so on and people get so uh, excited about that, that you kind of have to talk them down a little bit. And that can be a little bit frustrating to deal with uh, because obviously we're nowhere near competitive and it's going to take a long time before uh, we will be. So um, not, none of the things that you brought up were negative. I think they're just fact, like we don't have all of these technologies yet and it's just going to take time to, to build them. But I think we are, making good progress and uh, the future is open. What's really interesting to me is uh, I, I feel like there's like an evolutionary question here about like what is acceptable enough for people to the vast majority of people to like use it and even make it a daily driver. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that's, it's like a really interesting question and you can see that even a little bit in uh, the Chromium browsers, a lot of, they're actually missing a bunch of those things when they're new. Yeah, I, I think that sort of thing has always been part of the web, at least, at least for as long as I've been a web citizen. Um, when I was a kid, it was, uh, the site works best in this or that browser, you know, um, like you need NN4 to browse here, or you, you got to get IE5. Uh, and these days it's, you got to use a Chromium based browser and I think they're just kind of different sides of the same coin. Like there's always going to be somebody who's pushing for new APIs and new um, quote unquote standards. Um, 
to to become part of the platform and i think it's perfectly fine to lag behind on stuff like that uh, with ladybird i'm primarily interested in implementing stuff that is used by the sort of overwhelming majority of the web and uh, make the engine hackable enough and pluggable enough that in the future um, if there is a demand for more like niche features, then it will be reasonably easy to to add them to the engine. But it's it seems at the moment like if I ch have to choose where to spend my time, I would rather implement like more core CSS JavaScript functionality than than any of these um, you know new um, fancy things that are only used by a, a fraction of a percent of, of websites. Yeah, uh, that's not to say that they're bad ideas. It's just that. Um, just kind of trying to go where the big ball is instead of chasing the small ball. Yeah, I mean that's what I was. That was actually my point with the the other Chromium, the not Chrome, the other Chromium based browsers. Right. They also frequently like lack many of these. They're not sort of I don't know, like Tim would say, the waft and weft of the web. Right. That that's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. One of the things that struck me, like, the, the, I guess the, the thing that's most surprising to me is, like, if you go to Google or Apple or Firefox, like, you know, the people who work on the JavaScript engine, they're not generally the people who work on layout. And even within layout, you have people who specialize in, like, internationalization or, you know, there's lots of sort of specialization. And but you have to solve everything. <laughs> And that is really interesting to me. Like, is that intimidating to you at all? Or are you just like built differently? Like, um, it was intimidating when I started building the operating system, I was intimidated. Uh, and I just kept pushing through that for so long that I forgot. I, I woke up one day and I forgot to be intimidated, I think. And hmm. it just um, stayed off since then. So I, I stopped caring. And I think. Um, I also have my YouTube channel where I sort of broadcast myself programming, and that has been very helpful in just um, taking down my ego because whenever I make a mistake, I hear about it from people making fun of me. And um, and at first, that was really hard because I wasn't used to that. Right. Like harsh feedback and people, you know, making silly jokes about stupid things that I would do. Um, but But over time, that kind of accumulated into this uh, hardening of my uh, of my soul, I guess, where I just became able to push through that kind of intimidation stuff, and it was a lot of work. But I'm happy that that I went through that process because now I'm I'm happy to like take on anything and suck at it for a while and um, do it anyway until I get somewhat better. Uh, and then by the time I get somewhat better at something, I hopefully I've managed to put something together that other people can help me improve. Uh, and that's sort of how most of Serenity OS, most of Ladybird started was just me pushing through, sucking at something I didn't know how to do and figuring some of it out and then other people coming in and helping. Yeah. Uh, and I still do a lot of that, but uh, <laughs> nowadays I, I, I have gotten a bit more specialized recently because um, there's just so much specialized work to do on a browser. like. You mentioned Grid and Flexbox, for example. I've spent weeks working on our Flexbox implementation, just getting various details right. And it requires some amount of specialization. But I think in a, in a project like ours, it's we can't afford to all be specialists. Um, it's OK to specialize for short periods. But um, at the core, if we want to make progress with such a small team and, and such a shoestring budget, we have to be willing to be generalists. Do you support SVG? I think you do, right? Yeah. Um, MathML? Not, uh, no, not, no MathML. And our SVG support is still, um, still evolving, but uh, it has been getting better and better recently. I just worked on it today, actually. Nice. I, I saw a photo of you at the Hackfest with uh, Nico. Oh, yeah. And I was... I, I think I even tweeted, and it was tongue in cheek, but I'm serious. Were you working on your SVG? Because that's <laughs> Nico's bag. Yeah, I, I've known Nico for over a decade, and um, but it was the first time we ever met in person. 
Uh, and I don't know that we were working on SVG at this exact moment, but uh, we did end up talking a lot about SVG because we are recently struggling a bit with SVG text and trying to fit it into our rendering model um, because we we hadn't hadn't worked on SVG before, none of us. So it was helpful to talk to Nico about what the requirements are for SVG text. What did you learn? Um, the most interesting thing I learned was that every character has to be individually positionable, I guess. Um, mm. And in order to support like um, rendering a, the text along the outline of a path, you um, need to be able to place them sort of independently of each other, but they should still behave as if they're on a contiguous line so that you can select them and so on. Um, and that's going to require a bit of um, changes to our architecture to support that. There's a question that I asked of Martin that I would like to also ask you, which yeah. is like, how much do you benefit? Like, so you don't actually just go and take a library and port it or something. You don't ever do that. Right. Like, but right. But you do like, you're not inventing everything from whole cloth, right? Like you have the benefit of being able to study and see standards and also like be familiar with people who have done this before mm -hmm. and ask questions. Like how much do you think that you benefit from that? Cause I think when you say like, I spent a few weeks working on Flexbox, like, yeah, I mean, people spent way more than a few weeks working on Flexbox and other <laughs> engines. So like, do you, do you benefit from coming in late and other people having made a lot of mistakes and like having the problem sorted out and maybe people you can talk to or some code you can look at or? Uh, yeah, we absolutely benefit from, from being um, standing on the shoulders of giants. That's absolutely a thing. Um, there is, you know, not just the specs, um, that have improved so much over the years, but there's like countless discussions on the, um, what BG GitHub, for example, you can go and read discussions on um, spec bugs where people explain and, and argue in depth about, oh, why should it be this way? Why should it be that way? So there's just, there's a tremendous amount of information you can absorb if you know where to look. Um, and, you know, I, I, as we talked about, I also have a background in browsers, so I do know how to go and, and find information because it was my my job for many years as well. Uh, so I, I know where the information is. I have friends who who work on other browsers still. Um, so I think me personally, I benefit so much from from having done it for a long time. Just like anybody with experience doing something is going to be drawing on that experience, of course. Um, but as a project, we also benefit from from other engines having pushed the standards forward, having improved the platform, and also just from the web being a sort of an, an open platform that's developed in the open. Um, it would be much harder to to do this kind of stuff with uh, a closed platform, obviously. Like if we were trying to implement a .NET uh, VM or something. Yeah. So you also recently, I think, um, like made a little Qt. A browser for regular Linux based on LibWeb. Mm -hmm. That is, I guess, the straight Linux port of Ladybird. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I I would like to try that actually, but I'm curious, like, how does that work exactly? Like, you just have to. I mean, I guess you're both using. I guess you're using C, so you just compile it for Linux, right? Um, and it's just right. not so, taking advantage of any anything in the operating system necessarily. Right. So we use Qt to create um, a simple GUI that has a toolbar and a, a location text editor, you know, where you can type in a URL. Uh, and then we make a little scrollable viewport and then libweb does the rest, basically. Uh, so we don't use Qt for anything that you see in the web view itself. Uh, none of the text rendering or like 2D graphics or 3D graphics, all of that is our own code. So it's the, the Qt application is really just a thin uh, GUI shell for the engine. What, what about inputs, dialogue? Um, 
Oh, inputs like keyboard? Uh, no, I mean like in input element, select element. Um, oh, um, so things that have th things that often are, you know, use a windowing toolkit. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so we haven't implemented all of them. So uh, we only have text input, password input, uh, buttons, checkbox and, and radio buttons, I think. Maybe I'm forgetting some, but we haven't done select elements yet. And we're missing a bunch of other, the other ones. And we haven't done validation yet. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's a sort of an open question how we're going to deal with looking more native on Linux platforms. It would be easy to to make it look like a Serenity OS input elements, but that might look a little bit out of place. That's an interesting question, actually. Um, there's debate on this, and uh, Dominic DiNicola, who's one of the editors of HTML, uh, a few years ago, were uh, they were thinking about a couple of new features, and they said, you know, there's this constant debate, and uh, we don't have to do the thing that we always did. Um, so like, which would you prefer? Like the same browser to present the same controls in every operating system. Like if you open Chrome, it always looks like Chrome. If you look at Safari, well, it is only available in one place. So that's not, <laughs> that's not much, but, uh, Firefox, for example, you open it anywhere, they all look the same or do we match the operating system? And I thought, like, I was convinced in my head, like, this is the most ridiculous question. Like, this is going to be such a, like, one-sided, there's clearly one answer to this. And no, it was, like, literally 50-50. So I don't think there is a right answer to that. And you should do whatever is interesting to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, maybe the ideal answer is that we would just let you choose. Sure. If possible. Yeah. I could see that. <clears throat> I'm on the side of stick with the operating system, but... That's me. So I did forget to mention that uh, we do use Qt for networking currently on Linux really? because mm. uh, our multi-process networking um, service, we haven't gotten it to run nicely on Linux yet. Uh, we mm. do have our own implementation of uh, HTTP, TLS, all of that jazz, uh, but we have yet to bring it up on Linux. So we are just piggybacking on the... Um, networking stuff in Qt at the moment. And we have an open bug about getting rid of that so that we can eat our own dog food instead. Uh, okay. So you have a you have a pragmatic build-it-yourself approach, which is build-it-yourself unless you really need to bring in something else and then plan to replace it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's only on Linux, right? Yeah, that's only on Linux. On right. Serenity itself, we use our own uh, TLS stack. Such a compromise... I guess wouldn't be made on Serenity, right? To just no, port right. something for now. You know, um, it's something that, like early on, for example, when I was just working on this by myself, I um, used a handful of um, like C library routines from from OpenBSD, I think, mm -hmm. and then I went and sort of replaced them um, down the line as as the project matured, and I just wanted to get rid of all the borrowed code. Yeah. And I'm sure that there are still some little things here and there with like an OpenBSD um, origin that we need to replace. It just needs to be tracked down. Hmm. Um, so it, I think for me, the important thing nowadays is that we definitely don't want anybody bringing any proprietary IP into the project. And we don't want people to take um, something that's GPL because we are a BSD license project. So that wouldn't be entirely cool and of course the spirit of the project is that we're supposed to make things ourselves even though it's hard so right um even right. if you could legally take something we ask people that they don't and that they go through the, the the suffering of doing it themselves just so that we we get the kind of system that is built that way mm -hmm. so i mean we've you've mentioned the contributors and and uh you know hoping that people haven't stuck past you how many contributors are there uh, you know sort of in the main oh my goodness well i think we have over 900 total um but like active core contributors on a monthly basis tends to swing up to around 50 maybe recently hmm. um but it, it goes up and down depending on what people are doing and um, right 
their bursts where people get excited about something um, mm. and then a bunch of people join in and they, they work on that for a while and then kind of interest fades and some new thing uh, attracts mm. everybody. Right. It ebbs and flows. But one of the kind of unique things about our project is that it's such a huge ecosystem that even if you come in because you're excited about one thing, it's really easy to stick around and get distracted by a million other things. Like maybe you come in because you want to work on a file management thing and then you end up implementing, uh, you know, WebP or something instead, um, which we recently got, by the nice. way. Like, like ladybirds flitting from plant to plant. <laughs> right. There you go. Um, and you talked some about the, uh, the contributor community Mm -hmm. In your talk for Web Engines Hack Fest, you know what? Can you share some of your observations there with with the audience here? Well, most of the people who work on Ladybird have no prior experience working on browsers, and that in particular is very exciting to me because <laughs> um, I've been in browsers most of my professional life, and it always seemed to me like a fairly small kind of almost tight-knit community, even though it was spread across multiple organizations. Um, people still kind of float between these organizations. And uh, mm. if you look at Google today, there's a bunch of ex-Mozilla people. And, yeah. uh, you know, people have just been moving around like that. There are only so many people in the world who want to be browser developers. And, yeah. um, or at least so I thought um, until I started doing it on YouTube and just broadcasting what it's like to an audience of, of random onlookers. And it turned out that um, it could be made interesting to more people by by sort of letting them in on this angle of it. And I'm really, really happy to have been able to introduce so many people to it and gotten hundreds of hundreds of, of newcomers just to, to do a, a patch or two for a browser engine. Even if most people end up not loving it enough to stick around, we still have a bunch of people who, who have stuck around and, and worked on it. And that to me is a really wholesome aspect of, of what I get to call my job. So I'm happy about that. Yeah. No, that's, that's really, that's really interesting. So you feel it was YouTube that was the driver there. I think, yeah, that, that really has been the main uh, driver of new people. Um, at least until this point, if I compare like my numbers, uh, my audience numbers on every platform that I use to to attract people to what we're doing, YouTube is by far doing the best. And the, the format is surprisingly interesting to people. It's just uh, here's a browser. Here is the website that doesn't look right. I'm going to make it look right. Stick with me for an hour and we'll figure it out. Yeah, I have to say, I didn't watch any of the ones where you worked on browser features, but I did watch the one where you worked on like doing the Qt browser mm -hmm. for Linux. And um, so just for, for background, like like I did some computer science in college and like I had to learn C back then. But professionally, I was only did C once or twice. So like the C world is like intimidating to me, but I can open WebKit source code and find things. And if I read slowly, I can figure it out, you know? Um, so it's intimidating to me. And every once in a while I like get WebKit and get it built and then just like lose steam. It's so much yak shaving to get it built <laughs> in the first place that I, that I yeah. lose the steam to do it. But the reason I mentioned that is because I like turned it on and immediately you were going pretty fast and I was like, oh man, this is really, this is like really intimidating. Look how much this guy just really knows what he's doing. Like, I am not sure I'm going to be able to follow this at all, but like, it didn't take long before like you rammed your face into the door a few times with the same kind of stuff that trips me up. And like somehow that just made it like very engaging and like more plausible somehow that I could do it. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. So I, I think that's, I think it's motivating. Like you struggled a lot in that, right? Like I, I watched it. I don't know if that's common, but like there were things that you knew that you didn't have to look up. You did like you were doing it, you know, like riding a bike. You were so fluent in it. That stuff was cool. But honestly, the parts where you struggled, 
were just so relatable and like watching you work through them. I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I would have done too. And like one by one, you just have to step through the things, you know? Yeah, totally. And I, I think that's one thing that many people who make programming content, um, video content in particular, they kind of make the wrong choice by editing out mistakes and trying to look perfect and fast and right all the time. Um, because as you say, then it kind of just ends up looking intimidating or too polished and you don't get that human side of it. Um, like you, you got to show the frustration and the, the stupid mistakes. Uh, at least I, f I really feel like that's how I've been able to like build an audience is by just showing the whole thing with warts and all. Yeah. And yes, that is representative by the way. Like I, I do screw up in every single video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well in life too, it's pretty easy right. to screw up. I think it's important to keep in mind. I, I am really, really excited uh, about uh, seeing where this goes uh, in the rest of my lifetime, basically, uh, not, you know, in the next six months, although that's also exciting, but to see where all this develops, because, you know, KHTML, uh, kind of runs the world now and it didn't, sure didn't start that way. Right. Yeah, indeed. Uh, it I took think a very long time. <laughs> these are very exciting times right now. I think I'm super excited that Servo is back on the menu. Um, yeah. it's so cool that Egalia has picked that up. And, um, I don't know, it's, it's just exciting and it's going to be fun to see who makes progress on what and, and who hits which milestones first. And we can have a little browser war, even though it, yeah, it, it could be, it could be that. I, I think that currently they will, they're hard to compare. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, because like they had such different focus. I always understood Servo to be a, a an experiment above all. Um, it was, yeah. And I think a lot of great things have come out of that. And I hope that they carry that forward and, and continue to be experimental or experiment friendly, at least, because mm -hmm. there's so many things that you could do in a browser engine that is very inconvenient to do in the big engines, because there's so much code you would have to rewrite just to try out new architectures and new ways of doing things, right? Um, one thing that I thought of in this um, area is that um, one of the things that we try to do with our browser and with our engine is that we try to write it as close to the spec as possible. Um, this is a bit different from the way other browsers are made, at least the ones I've been familiar with, like WebKit, Chromium, and, and Gecko, where they are happy to you know, invent their own abstractions and solve things in their own ways. Mm -hmm. We are very, very hardcore about sticking to spec architecture and spec language and using the spec names for everything wherever we can in part because it makes it just easier to implement the spec if if you write it exactly as the spec says to to the fullest extent possible um, but also for maintainability uh, mm -hmm. because we have to recognize that the platform is alive right and it keeps changing and keeps mutating um, and if we want to have a chance to react and adapt to future changes um, i really believe that we'll be in the best position to do that if we keep ourselves as close to the current spec as possible. Um, so we are um, in, in HTML, for example, we have like our class names in C++ are just the same exact words that they use for the same concepts in the HTML spec. Um, our CSS mm -hmm. layout engine is organized around formatting contexts, um, unlike Unlike the way it works in, in uh, the other engines where they invent their own ways to do layout. And uh, it's just a, a theme throughout. And, and we also take it a step uh, even further by uh, copying spec text word for word and just copy pasting it as a comment into our code so that you can always cross reference um, the spec with the code because we have the spec right there. Um, so it's sort of interleaved. So you would have a spec comment that says like step three, do X, Y, Z, and then the code X, Y, Z, step four, and so on. Uh, and it, it's, it took a while to convince ourselves that this was a good way to work because it makes the code a lot bigger uh, and it can look bloated. But after we get used to it, uh, I don't think we would ever go back because it's, it's such a, an 
much easier way to stay on top of stay on top of the spec and what the spec intends and to be able to react to changes. Yeah, Martin made a similar comment actually because I guess this is a thing in Rust, uh, I'm sorry, in Servo at least in the newer so mm -hmm. Servo has two uh layout engines and I guess this is something that it seems all of the engines have learned and started changing to do that. Um Yeah. Martin he seemed to suggest that this is this is basically a lesson that all of the browser engines have learned and you know it's hard to we can't just rewrite them <laughs> but we can migrate them in that direction right yeah and uh, for us it's a lot easier to do this because we are in a greenfield environment right yeah. like we don't have a huge stack of code that needs to be rewritten um, so we've been able to make really good and fast progress towards this and that's really nice but of course the others will catch up and and I think it would be great if if more engines look more like the spec mm -hmm. um, because it will be easier to cross-reference and, and catch bugs and so on. And it will also be easier for people to move between different engines and, and like people with special interests who want to implement a feature in all engines. Um, the more the code looks to the spec, like the spec everywhere, the easier it will be for them as well. Yeah. So Serenity is currently, has been anyway, like a passion project basically for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, like we want to do it because we believe we can do it and we want the outcome, this thing where like it's not disconnected libraries. But do you see that there are potentials for it to be something more than that? Like can you imagine use cases for Serenity that like it could be a, a practical choice or, or Ladybird where people could use it for you know, other purposes. I mean, WebKit is used for lots more than, you know, lots more than Safari. Right. Yeah. Well, for me personally, with Serenity, I just want to build an operating system that I can use. That mm -hmm. was always my goal since uh, day one. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to, to welcome other people into the project with their own goals who want to adapt it to something they want to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for me personally, I just want to make something that I can use as my daily driver. And I have pretty simple needs. I just need a terminal and a browser and an IDE. So mm -hmm. are reasonably easy to, to satisfy. Your videos, you're not using Serenity to do your code, in, are you? Right. I, I do not um, because it, it's not practical. Um, we don't have the ability to record video and we don't have USB webcam support. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also, uh, compile performance is not as good on Serenity as it is on Linux. Mm -hmm. So I just record on Linux because it's more practical. Right. Uh, I tend to be a very pragmatic person in, in all these kind of things. Honestly, recently I'm focusing way more on just building the browser in a cross-platform environment. And it's still, all, everything I work on is still part of the operating system. I've just been kind of uh, swept away with with the fun of, of building um, a, a browser that might potentially be useful to more people than just myself. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, that's that's sort of what I was thinking with, you know, the more useful you can make it to more people, it seems that you get more contributions, which then makes it more useful to more people <laughs> and so right, on. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, and I, I think um, it's important to be realistic and realistically, uh, Serenity OS will never be um, something that's used by millions of people, at least not with the um, with the goals that we currently have for it. And with Ladybird, that's much more no of an open question, I think, because it's much harder to tell the future. We have great momentum. We have um, we're making great progress, and who knows how long we can keep that rate of progress? Like, what will be the first major roadblock? Like, what kind of problems will we face? Who knows? Yeah. Um, but it's it's exciting to sort of run towards it and see what so we can see what's there. I think that's actually a good place to wrap it up. Yeah, okay. sure. Andreas, thank you so much for for spending your time with us and sharing all of these insights. Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Happy to meet you guys. Yeah. yeah. And then what we usually ask is uh, where can people find you on the intertubes? Oh well, I'm on Twitter as Awesome Kling and also on YouTube as Awesome Kling. Okay. Very nice. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks, thank you.